everybody. It's Pete H. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. I've got a cool episode today. So we get a lot of guys from history and guys associated with history. And, and this is sort of someone who crosses both uh, both levels. His name is Jim Belker. And Jim is the son of someone who survived the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Jim's dad uh, has passed on, and it was one of the, I guess, about 400 dudes they pull out of the, uh, they pull out of the ocean. Another one has been on the show, by the way, and he's from Benicia, my hometown. His name is Harold Bray, and he is still with us. And so his show will be in the, his link, I should say. His episode will be in the show notes. You can also go to YouTube and just type in Harold Bray Break It Down Show or Jim Belker Jr. and type in Break It Down Show after that. You should be able to find it. Joining me in this episode is Martin Bennett. And here's why Martin's important. T. Martin Bennett, as he's known as an author, Martin writes a story about the guy who basically is the first Japanese guy to fly into Pearl Harbor on, on, on uh, the attack. And he hates America and he's a warrior and he's the guy that starts the war. And ultimately, immigrates to the U.S. and raises his family and loves America in the end. And this is sort of the same thing with Jim's dad. Jim's dad wasn't big on Japan, but goes there during the occupation time, post-World War II, falls in love with a Japanese woman. And from that comes a lifelong relationship that Jim Belker Jr. comes from. So Jim is, he's inexorably tied to the indie. He understands what it means to you know, see someone go through these trials and tribulations, go through these periods of hate, but then come out on the other end loving. And I think that's an important message for today when we're all trying to look at each other and decide who's evil and who's not and just assign it to them. I mean, we had that dude from Mumford and Sons just leave the band because he was given, he was bringing grief upon the band for saying he read Andy Noe's book. Goodness gracious, we got to do better than that. So uh, I think this is a great episode to try to realize that between these two guys, between Martin and Jim and their work, we can get over enormous bounds. We can get through a lot of conflict. And then if we can't, then the conflict will seem way worse than just trying to get along a little better. I think this episode is, is about that. Anyhow, uh, you're going to love it, Jim Belker Jr. And then if you are interested in the USS Indianapolis and its history, you can just go to their website, ussindianapolis.com. There are a few of these veterans left. They have incredible things. We're going to be trying to do some stuff with Harold this year. COVID has sort of slowed us down on what we were going to try to do last year, but we're trying to get back to it now that we can sort of move around and do things. Everybody, if you don't know the history of the U.S. as Indianapolis, it's a uh, quint monologue in Jaws is about that. It's a ship that delivered one of the atomic bombs. And when it leaves where it drops it off, it goes unescorted onto this next thing. It doesn't make it. And, and they're sunk by a Japanese sub and no one no one knows that they are sunk. And so they have these hundreds and hundreds of men. Uh, So about a third of the crew went down with the ship right away. Ship sinks like 12 minutes, a third of the uh, two thirds of the crew survive. But then over the course of the next five days until they're accidentally discovered, another three or 400 people die. And so you have these uh, remaining survivors and now you have these last, just this last few guys that are out there still doing it. So it's an incredible story. Uh, Jim's doing incredible work as the guy who runs the organization that supports all the USS and D survivors. And if you ever want to know anything about that, Jim is your point of contact. Jim's a friend of the show now and someone I really look up to. He's kind of like my big brother. I, I'm going to follow in his footsteps. All right. Enough about that. Save the brave, save the brave.org. Go there and contribute. If you want to do something else with charity, you should do it. Get to work on charity. And if you want to support us, here's a great way to do it. Go to breakitdownshow.com, go to the PayPal link, should be top of the page, and just put a little small amount monthly in there. I'm telling you, this makes a big difference. I mean, I'm going to be on the road a lot this summer, in part because of this. You're buying gas. You're helping me buy ads. You're helping me buy equipment. You're helping me buy airline tickets. All of this stuff is going into getting me on the road and finding us bigger and better stories and making the show even bigger and better than before. So if you love what I do, if you love all of us here on this crew, Put to work your money every now and then, and I will promise I will come back and you will get something for it. All right. Thank you all so much. Here comes Jim Belker Jr. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Jim Belcher, Jr., and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Jim Belcher, I've been saying the wrong way all day. (laughs) day (laughs) Hey, Jim, thanks for coming on the show. uh, The story of your work, uh, the story of your dad and and his 
his peers is incredible. Your father saw, survived the sinking and then subsequent lack of discovery for five days of the of the Indianapolis. We've had Harold Bray on the show. And anytime we have a conversation like these kind of things, I started to think who would be a great co-host. Mm-hmm. And when you told me that you, the story of your dad is also the story of Japanese reconstruction, meeting and falling in love with a Japanese girl, I, like, <laughs> I got it. I need to have Martin Bennett on because he has a similar story in his book, and he's been on the show before, of of a World War II fighter who who hates the Americans and then ultimately falls in love with America and raises his family there. And this is especially after watching the Super Bowl, fellas, with all of these uh, commercials about unity. You know, we have a map for this, and it looks yeah. like getting along and and doing well. So, so first off, Jim, thank you so much for. Yeah for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And then Martin, when I suggested this to you to have Jim on the show, what were your thoughts? Well, it's a fascinating story. I love history, but I'm the kind of guy that I don't like to go shallow. I want to go deep and I just don't have time. So it's either I'm kind of an all or nothing person. So uh, it's definitely on my list to read this book, but uh, I will have a thousand questions about this story because it's just, it's a really, really interesting and intriguing story. And a sad story. Yeah, it, it, it's probably as tragic as any World War II story can be. And, and it's multi-layered because it continued on up to today. Uh, when, when that submarine sinks your father's ship and in moments, 1,200-ish people on board, 300 go down almost instantly. And then they lose another, gosh, 600 you know, to, to sharks and exposure and salt water. And, and just for the, you guys should definitely listen to our Harold Bray episode. And we're not going to get a whole lot into the sinking because there's a lot of stuff on that already, sure. but there's definitely things out there. One of the things that I found fascinating, Jim, was that they, as they were rescuing these guys, it was so, it took so long that they were expiring. They even rescued a guy who ultimately doesn't survive because he, you know, it's like I think they pulled 317 out and 316 actually survived this thing. Yeah, it's 320. They pulled out of the water alive. 316 made it to shore just from the rescue ships to shore. It was it was a very tragic situation. Uh, there's a YouTube video, if you ever get a chance, with um, Paul Murphy. Uh, he just totally breaks down talking about those four guys that died and what their mothers and families must have thought that they were rescued alive and then didn't make it. How sad. But, and what about the um, the senior? Isn't this, wasn't the senior ranking person on the ship just hooking a ride? No, uh, the senior ranking person, the guest. There was a guest on the ship. I yeah. know he was a naval officer. I don't know him. I don't know his family, but he was a. I know he was an acquaintance, I believe, of Captain McVeigh. So he was hitching a ride to the Philippines to Leyte, and how unfortunate that had to be. There were the one passenger on the ship, and he didn't make it. Yeah. Well, the flip side of the coin is the Indianapolis went to Guam after Tinian Tinian and dropped off some people. Who were those people who got dropped off? How many were there? And I wonder how they felt after that. It's it's interesting. Um, It actually goes back just before that at Mare Island, uh, where they picked up their secret cargo to go to Tinian. They had a crew changeover that was massive. Uh, About a quarter to a third of the crew was new. My dad was one of those guys. He'd only been on the ship five weeks and three days when it sank. And he'd only been to sea, what, 15, 16 days. That was his first ship, 18 years old. And Harold Bray was the same situation. A lot of the guys got on the ship at Mare Island, and that was their first cruise. And, uh, you know, it was very sad. And then they did stop at uh, Pearl on the way. It was a speed trip to get the bomb there. As far as I know, nobody got on or off at, at Pearl because of security. Uh, and then they got to Guam and they did have uh, some guys got off. I know the the uh, um, printer, one of the guys on the ship was a printer and another ship there at Guam needed a printer. So he got off. A couple of the guys got off. But again, because of security, they didn't want too many people getting off the ship right away. And then they came back to Guam. A few more guys got off and then uh, they went on that last voyage and, of course, uh, didn't make it to Leyte in the Philippines. But those guys who, who got off, they dodged an incredible bullet. Their life right, was right, absolutely right. transformed. It must have been shocking to them for the rest of their lives. Of it, They could it, have it, stayed on that ship. You know, at first, that's that, that would be the layman's view of it. But let me tell you, let me go deeper because I've talked to some of those guys. They come to the reunions. They carry, I'd almost say they carry more guilt 
than the guys who were in the water that survived. Right, survivor's guilt, right. Because not only did they avoid, first of all, a lot of the guys on the ship were their friends. They knew them. Some, A lot of the guys that got off, including that one third crew changeover, those guys have been on the ship for years. So the remaining guys were close friends of theirs, with the exception of the new crew. So they lost a lot of buddies. And they got off by pure luck in their mind. But then the fellows that were in the water at least could look back and say, you know, I suffered five days and survived. They still carried tremendous guilt. My dad did. Most, a lot of them had drinking problems and a lot of issues. But those guys who didn't even spend five days in the water, they, they, I think they felt more guilt than anybody else in the crew. It was, you know, and I consider them part of the crew. Even though there's a lot of debate about, you know, the final sailing list, who was on the ship at the end. There, but we have to remember the people that suffered went way beyond the guys on the ship, way beyond. It, the rescue men, the, these young 17, 18, 19 year old uh, boys that pulled up in the middle of the night and saw these guys being attacked by sharks and body parts and the water, they weren't prepared for that. And they, they suffered their entire lives. They suffered uh, nightmares and night terrors and guilt for what else could we have done? If we'd have turned left instead of right, maybe we'd have found another group of guys. Uh, horrible, horrible guilt. All of these guys uh, can't describe it. it. It's similar to Waylon Jennings, you know, and how he felt. And it caused him, you know, part of his addiction problem was getting over the whole the day the music died thing because he wins or loses a coin flip, you know, and. It, yeah. Obviously, whatever these things happen, there's a lot of people that go down with that ship for sure. And this is what sure. we're talking about. Yeah. And, and, and you know, what part of my awareness when I'm in schools, it is an opportunity to talk about tolerance and forgiveness because, you know, these guys, one of our primary guests now at the reunions is the granddaughter of uh, Captain Hashimoto, the captain of the submarine that sank. Wow. And of course, Captain Hashimoto went to bat for Captain McVeigh every single time, starting in 1945 at the court martial, all the way up until the exoneration. He wrote a letter to Congress telling them that I still don't understand why you court martialed him. He didn't do anything wrong. There's a lot of room for, for, uh, tolerance and forgiveness, but I go into the schools also to remind kids to sacrifice what, what the, the price these people paid. Not just the ones who were lost at sea, they paid the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, the, but the guys who lived, uh, you know, I'm the child of a survivor. I can tell you firsthand, and most of us children can, that our dads had a lot of baggage. And, um, you know, they pass that on to their kids. <laughs> I, I I went in the Air Force in uh, 70 six, January 76, right after Vietnam, uh, specifically the Air Force, because I couldn't get along with my dad. I was the oldest of three boys and had grown up under his thumb. And he stayed in the Navy till 69. He didn't retire until 1969. He was World War II, Korea, Vietnam. Jesus. So I think he did it because he had nowhere else to go. He really belonged in the Navy. He felt like it was the only safe place for him. And, uh, he stayed until 69, and Vietnam drove him out of the Navy. He would have stayed longer, except uh, he couldn't stomach that war. He, he told me, he said, <laughs> this isn't a war. One of the things that, that, and I want to get back into your dad, and I want to give Martin some time to ask questions, but another thing that struck me as I was thinking about this and reading is the time frames. Because the India is delivering you know, the atomic bomb, this war is in effect, over. Like, there's only so many more ships that are going to get sunk. And so they get sunk, and then, what, not not even three weeks later, the war is essentially over. You know, the uh, the Japanese surrender, the submarine that yeah. sinks them in five weeks. You know, it, it's just that fast a time. And that means your dad must have fallen in love within months, ultimately, of this happening. I mean, I'm not saying like two or three months, but it's a short hunk of time where all of these things happen. And it's it's crazy when you think about the dramatic changes that were happening in that short, you know, we, we think of things now as like, oh man, it's so, you know, it's been doing this forever. It's not, it's fast. Time moves fast in these kind of situations. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, again, I can't speak for the men I've talked to, I've known over the years. I first met him in 77. My dad never talked about the sinking. I was 12 when I found out he was even on the ship and he was getting ready to retire. But over the years, I've had a chance to talk to these hundreds of the guys, and they have 
almost to a man, are pretty united in the way that they feel about their captain and feel about what happened out there at sea and who the real heroes are. Not one of these guys will ever admit to be doing anything heroic or being a hero. To them, you know, they'll say it over and over and over. The heroes are still out there. 879 sailors still out there. And and what I was saying about the Vietnam War, I just wanted to clarify for my Vietnam veteran buddies. Dad's feeling was that the war could have been won if we were committed to winning the war, not that it wasn't a war. Oh, he knew it was a war. He was he was he was in country in Korea and Vietnam. He was very aware of the situation. What his con- concerns were was we had not fought a war in his mind since World War II the way we should, which is all out to win. You know, it, it, it's disappointing to all of us veterans who have watched these uh, modern wars, which are more political wars than they are. Uh, you know, anything else, we're putting guys in harm's way. So my dad felt that way. I felt that way. We've, we've grown up in a family. My mother's still alive. And, you know, we talk a little bit about the current wars. And, and she, of course, was a survivor of World War II in country, had three schools burnt to the ground during the war that while she was trying to attend. And then at the end was convinced that the Americans were going to slaughter them anyway. So my perspective of World War II was growing up in a house where both my parents talked about the horrors of war uh, from their point of view. And uh, I, I just went into school thinking that's just what World War II was like until I started hearing American history in classes and realizing it was very one sided. And we had a total lack of understanding of the Japanese people. We almost wanted to make them aliens like they were from another planet or something. And yet my mother, when I asked her one time, did you know, she was using the sharpened, they were training in school to kill an American during the invasion with a sharpened bamboo stick. And she was one of those young girls, 11 and a half years old. And I said, did you want to die? I mean, this Japanese mentality of Bushido and, you know, you know die for the emperor. And she said, oh, no, none of us wanted to die, but we were going to die anyway. The propaganda had been so heavy from before and during the war that she was convinced that the Americans, when they got there, were going to slaughter them anyway. So what would we do? That's what I try to pose to our young people today. I said, what would we do if somebody came, invaded our country, occupied our country, and they're going to slaughter us anyway? I mean, you'd fight to the death, right? You're going to die anyway. And you're not defending yourself. My mother never, ever worried about herself. It was her younger brothers and sisters, her parents, her grandparents, and all the men, her older brother, who was in the Imperial Japanese Army, my uncle, was off in China fighting for the Imperial Japanese Army. So there was nobody there who truly could defend them in her mind. So it was a very sad situation. You know, we're very lucky as Americans that we've never been in a situation like that in this country since, what, the Revolutionary War. I was curious about Commander Hashimoto. When did he first hear of the ship and the tragedy and what was his immediate reaction? The war must have been over by the time he found out. Do you know his story? Um, He wrote a book called uh, Sunk, and it's a pretty good book. And I read it several years ago, and I know he was aware uh, pretty soon after he sank. He knew he sank a big ship. He he thought it was a battleship. Um, uh, It was a heavy cruiser. He felt nothing but regret about the loss of life of the Indianapolis. There was no, his granddaughter says it over, but not once in his lifetime did she ever hear him talk in any kind of celebratory or proud way of sinking the Indianapolis. He was very concerned. Wasn't it true that he first thought it was a battleship? Yes. And yeah. because it was a cruiser, was it outside the scope of his, what he was supposed to be bringing down or not? No, 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 no. Towards the end of the war, I think he was desperate. The whole crew was desperate to sink a major warship. They they had not had very little to no luck up to that point. I've seen different accounts where people thought it, you know, his submarine was the most dangerous submarine in the Japanese Navy. Uh, by all accounts, uh, in, in his book, he was very, they, they seemed to be very unlucky up and until that evening. Uh, and then it was a pure stroke of luck that they sank the Indianapolis. I'm talking about one of the guys said it's a cascade of of uh, situations that all had to line up in the right place before it would even have been possible to sink the Indianapolis. But it all happened. And uh, and then the mistakes on, on the part of the U.S. Navy, different groups delayed the the response, the rescue to the point where uh, we probably 300 went down with the ship, 600 died in the water. Uh, some of those would have died anyway because they were injured, injured. But. Yeah, easily 400 guys, maybe 
or more of those who didn't come home would have been rescued if they'd have known that they were out there and came to their aid properly. The ship should never have been out there by itself in the first place. That's number one. It had no escorted. Yeah, unescorted. Yeah, but you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of precedent for that. You'll often read, oh, uh, first time a ship ever traveled unescorted of that size in that theater. Well, keep in mind the Indianapolis took the atomic bomb to Tinian unescorted. <laughs> they made a speed run, but no other ship could have kept up with them for that distance uh, at that speed. They went all the way to Tinian and then back to Guam unescorted, and then they were on their way to the Philippines. So by the time they were on their way to the Philippines, it probably seemed somewhat normal, even though it was abnormal for that time of the war in that theater. But keep in mind, this this is a big ship, you know, uh, 610 feet long and uh, uh, 1,200 men, nine eight-inch guns. I mean, it, it had everything except sonar. <laughs> sonar is something you might have wanted on that particular cruise, but uh, cruisers at that time didn't have sonar. Destroyers would have provided the sonar uh, and rescue a, a, a escort for them. See, the thing sure. about the, the, the escort wasn't that it would have protected the ship so much as it would have been there to have notified other people right away that they're in the water and let's get them out. That's, I, th I think that's the biggest issue right there is that they really probably should have. And Captain McVeigh did request escort and was denied. So Jim, how many of, of the Indies sailors went on to do what your dad did and work in Japan? I know Harold's like, get me to the middle of the United States. I don't want to be anywhere near water. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, when I first met them in 77, they were launching the submarine in Indianapolis and we went up to Groton. I was in the Air Force then, so I was in uniform. And, and that's when I first started to realize I was very aware of the fact that I was half Japanese. So I had to kind of tread carefully. If you know what I mean, I didn't know these guys and I didn't know how they felt about the Japanese. And I grew up in the 60s. Dad's from Alabama. And being half Japanese in the 60s in the South was not a pleasant experience. And we looked very Asian. I always joke. I said, when I hit six foot tall, nobody realized I was Japanese anymore. But uh, I was actually a dual citizen at birth. I was I was born in Japan at Yokosuka Naval Hospital in 57. And um, I'm, I'm the only child of a USS Indianapolis survivor that's uh, a Japanese citizen at birth. I was a dual citizen. My two brothers were born at Bainbridge Naval Training Center here in the United States later. And so they were full American citizens. So my mother and I are the only two actual Japanese citizens directly tied by you know, marriage to the USS Indianapolis, as far as I know. So yeah, our, our story is uh, unique. Uh, I, I do I do um, try to use that story in schools to help children, young people understand that we can get along, that we can tolerate one another and we can forgive one another. Uh, the, the thing about the Indianapolis survivors that amazed me from the very beginning was as much as I tiptoed around like I did in the 60s and 70s as a Japanese American in school, as a school kid. We knew no Japanese. We didn't speak Japanese. We didn't write Japanese. We used to joke at, at our house, the only thing Japanese in our house was my mother. <laughs> we, we, we had no decorations. We had nothing. Um, my mother came to my high school graduation in her kimono, surprised me. And I'll be very honest with you. I was, I was, I was embarrassed. I was shocked. We had spent our entire lives, here I was 18 years old, spent 18 years trying to avoid in this country being Japanese or any hint of it, total assimilation into the culture. And the, and then my mother shows up in a red kimono uh, at my graduation dance. And I was so embarrassed that, you know, I, I feel bad about that today, but I'll never forget the feeling I had when she walked in and I, I didn't understand why she would do that to me, uh, embarrass me that bad. Um, we live in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. So again, in 1975, I'm graduating. It, nobody had ever seen a kimono here in real <laughs> life. And uh, she was the only, there were only two Japanese women that lived in town here. And they were best friends, my mother and this other lady who married an army officer that retired. And so there were only six, five of us Japanese American kids in the whole town of 20,000 people. So it was, it was embarrassing. But years later, I came to appreciate it. And it's one of my most uh, cherished photographs. And, you know, I'm the only one that can go to a high school reunion and everybody talks about my mother at the, uh, at the graduation dance. 
nobody yeah. remembers anybody else's mother. <laughs> nobody else showed up in a kimono or anything. So, uh, so we, I learned real quick by the seventies, uh, people were starting to understand and tolerate better. But even today, you know, we have children that, uh, they get picked on for their ethnicity and, and, you know, I have some issues with some because I spent a whole lifetime trying to hide it. So uh, it, it makes me uncomfortable when I see young people making no attempt to hide it, to uh, speak the language. We were taught that speaking a foreign language, you know, in public was, was uh, for my mother, was uh, rude. So I still see it that way. And so I have a hard time still. I still have things that I'm adjusting to. But So you know that Mike Shinoda, Mike Shinoda of Lincoln Park is half Japanese. Is it? And he's, yeah, third generation. And he was uh, making uh, origami, you know, cranes. Yeah. And people said, why are you doing it? He says, because I'm part Japanese and I want to remember that. And, and I, I cherish that part of my culture and heritage. So I yeah. thought that was kind of cool. It is. It, a lot of us that are older, we're reaching back and trying to, uh, to get a, a reattachment to that culture that we tried to let go of for years. And, and I, I have a friend down in Texas. He's, uh, he's very much into the martial arts. I can't even tell you how many fights I avoided in uh, elementary and middle school because they just assumed that I knew karate. <laughs> and it, it, that's how strong that, uh, that uh, uh, belief was and that the cultural differences and, and stereotypes. Uh, I avoided a lot of fights just because they assumed I knew karate. And uh, I just, it went both ways, but it was mostly bad. And I, I, I have a lot of memories of mom uh, in, the, in Alabama uh, not being allowed into certain stores because she didn't fit the either door that they had. They had a colored door and they had a white door in the sixties and, and she was neither. Um, it was, a, it was t plus a little town my dad's from that was by the weirdest stroke of bad luck. There was another, uh, sailor from the Indianapolis on that was from Abbeville, Alabama, this tiny little town and he didn't make it. And then years later when dad stationed in, uh, for the Korean war in Japan, going in and out of Korea, and he marries a Japanese bride and brings her home to this little town. You can imagine what it must have been like for my mother, my mother and father coming back to that little town. Uh, and half the town is, you know, connected or related to um, this other sailor and, and how hard that must have been on everybody. I know it was hard on my mother and father. My dad never talked about that. I found out about that after he was gone in 2001. And it just, but of course, uh, you know, guilt by association is a terrible yeah. thing. Yeah, and to we bring, have to learn that. Yeah, yeah, it's that it, you know, when, again, young people today, I think, have a better handle on the diversity part and acceptance. But I still see the remnants of that anger and hatred that is unjustified. I tell you what, the 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 strongest. Resistance I get to being Japanese today as an adult, they're half Japanese, um, is from younger people who weren't in the war. They weren't there. Uh, they're th a lot of them. They're not even the children of. They're more like the grandchildren or nephews, or and they carry a tremendous amount of hate about. You know, they use the derogatory term still things like that towards the Japanese. And I look at them like, you weren't even there. How, how can you be so angry and you weren't there? And I know they picked a lot of that up from these veterans that came back from the war who saw horrible, horrible things and had horrible things happen to them. And they were angry and they were upset. And, you know, I'll never buy a Japanese car. I'll never uh, eat rice. Uh, I've heard all these things. And when I went into service, you can imagine the nicknames the guys, you know, had for me, <laughs> but a lot of them were, you know, they're service buddies. They're, uh, it's almost affectionate. I mean, you know, there was a camaraderie there that bridged that anger and, and hate. And, uh, uh, that's what I always look for with these young people is that they, that they can let some of that go and understand that we, we are all the same. My mother said, we're all the same. I didn't want to die. <laughs> you don't want to die. I don't want to die. <laughs> There's nothing Martin, there. I want to ask you, because you tell a similar story in your book of a, of a Japanese warrior who basically starts World War II. I mean, he's, if not the first, you know, he's, he's the prime guy. 
and he comes all the way back around towards tolerance and, and loving America and raising his family here. Well, he was steeped in this propaganda of the, uh, can I say, the superiority of Japanese, and it was just pumped into them by the elite in the military. I remember talking with a professor, and I said the, I said, the deification of the emperor and Shinto. I asked, it, was this something they believed, or was this something they just kind of used in order to manipulate the public to support their expansion ideas in East Asia. And he said, well, it's pretty much both. They used them both. But after the war, all that Shinto just kind of evaporated except as a vestige. But with Fuchida, he was told a lot of things about Americans that were false. But there were some things about Americans that were true that were really bad. And that's in my book, Wounded Tiger, about the League of Nations that happened after World War I. The Japanese asked for the Equality, the Racial Equality Act to be accepted. And it was rejected by the committee, and the head of the committee was President Wilson, and President Wilson was known to be racist, and yep. uh, it was it was it was bad. And so the Japanese were highly offended by this, and understandably so. And uh, they were really really you know felt like they were being relegated to a second class position. So it's kind of like I see Japan, and the United States as being. Japan walks into a bar, Japanese, you know, small guy, and the Americans laugh at him and tease him. And then he goes away and he comes back with a gun. And it's like, okay, now it's a different situation. Yeah. On the one hand, you can't blame the guy for being upset because Japan was mistreated by the, by the powers of the world. But on the other hand, you have to say, well, that's really not the right way to deal with it. So when Japan came against the United States in uh, Hawaii, uh, as a high school student, I thought, well, why are they doing this? Are they going to try to take over the United States? It didn't make any sense to me. So that was part of my research. But they essentially were hoping a preemptive uh, attack would would cause the United States to say, okay, we're going to stay out of East Asia in the same mm -hmm. sense the U.S. stayed out of Europe. It's not our problem. We were involved in World War I. Those guys are just killing each other all the time. We can't stop them. We don't want to be a part of that. The, the big mistake, of course, was the Japanese didn't expect the Americans to want revenge and to jump into the war after Pearl Harbor. They thought it would be the nail in the coffin. That would keep the U.S. out for good. It was the exact opposite inside of it. So as far as Puchita, he was furious. He was livid. And uh, he was glad to lead the attack on Pearl Harbor. And he called it the happiest day of his life at the time, which is hard for most people to understand. But when you get all the backstory, it makes sense, not necessarily justifiable or excusable. But it's understandable. But through a, a long series of events, he eventually understood the American mindset and uh, he respected Americans. He had a change in his heart toward why he was alive. He, he should have died on multiple occasions. And ultimately, he, yeah, he did live in the United States. His kids are, became citizens and um, he loved America. And the end of a World War II really is a, a happy ending. Americans loved history and culture. I'm wearing a hat right now. Uh, we love sushi. We love Japanese electronics and automobiles, and they love American culture and baseball. I mean, it's a, it's a happy ending, but my goodness, what a horrific way to get there. My, my mother said uh, at the announcement of the surrender, I asked her, what did you think? And she said, we were happy. Those were her exact words. We were happy. Uh, we yeah. were suffering. At the end yeah. of the war, there was so much suffering. There was so much hunger. There was so many shortages and there was no future. And it became evident to her as an 11 and a half year old that Japan was losing the war, which was hard to believe, even for my uncle. My uncle, I, I did get to talk to him in the 80s before he died. The one that was in Japan uh, or in China fighting for the Imperial Japanese Army. He told me that he thought that they were winning the war. And they had been fed that the entire. Oh, of course. And in China. He said, we were like a hot knife going through butter. He said there was nothing could stop us. And they were deeper in China. They were on the coast. And um, he had no clue when they got the first announcements that the war was over in August of 45. He said, we didn't believe it. And it actually took them sending a former commanding officer to them to get them to surrender. They surrendered well after the war ended uh, as a unit. Um, and he just could not believe it. And then after that, he never told, he had two sons that are my age. He never told his sons anything. I went to Japan in 2003 
And I met them and I asked them, he was already gone. Well, did your dad ever tell you his stories? And he had written me a 10 page letter when I was still interested in asking him questions by mail. Uh, and he told me his stories, drew me a map of where he'd been in China and so on. And uh, I was able to sit with his children, his two sons, and tell them their dad's stories. Um, they had never heard them, and they were full adults. It was, uh, it was very tragic uh, for the Japanese as well. It was very embarrassing to lose the war. They felt like they'd let their families and their, and their country down. It was, they were doing what they, just like our guys, they were doing what they were ordered to do for the most part. There were so many atrocities. I know I, I've never, ever sided with the Japanese as far as the atrocities that were committed, no more than the Germans that committed them. But we have to understand that it wasn't the, the average Japanese person that was doing those things. Um, and there was so much cruelty within the Imperial Japanese Army that didn't exist to that extent in the Imperial Japanese Navy. Um, we don't learn this history properly, and we need to understand better the, that there were tremendous uh, forces at work in Japan, uh, in particular with the military controlling the government, something we have to be, you know, there are so many lessons we can learn from all of this that are happening today uh, that we have to be very, very careful of. Um, you know, the presence of U.S. troops within the borders of the United States troubles me severely as a veteran and also as an American and also as a historian. And yet some people welcome that we're using American troops inside the borders of this country to protect what? The government? Um, that was exactly what the Constitution was set up not to do and not to allow. So we're trying, you know, I try to teach these young people to think, use their, use their brains, study history, learn from these conflicts, uh, things that, that uh, other countries did wrong. You know, Germany made a lot of mistakes to get into the war. Uh, Japan made tremendous uh, misjudgments of the Americans. Uh, the people that had been in the United States, the Japanese who had studied here and lived here, they warned They warned their government and they warned their, their uh, leaders, the Japanese army leaders, to, to not get into this. And, uh, One of the other things I want to ask you about is uh, there's there's the trope of, you know, the southern man who goes to Japan is not supposed to fall in love with someone from Japan. You know, your dad's from Alabama. Why, yeah. why wasn't he a raging bigot who couldn't stand anybody who was white? But the, this this is the problem with these things. We we end up being bigoted in our assessment of other people's bigotry. And so intolerance right. just stews together. So talk a little bit about. I mean, your dad, did he talk about falling in love with your mom or does your mom talk oh, yeah. about that much at all? Oh, yeah. We, we've had lots of conversations because, I mean, it's a total mystery to me how they would have even met uh, beyond, you know, casual acquaintance kind of thing. And, and think about it. I mean, my uncle was in the Imperial Japanese Army. For him to even get inside the family at all, to me, was just unbelievable. Uh, why would they let him in? Forget. I understand my Japanese, I mean, my Alabama families not accepting my mother and, and us children uh, to some extent. But why would they accept him into their family after all he had done? Um, he delivered the atomic bomb. Uh, he was on the ship that had delivered the atomic bomb. And my grandfather, I didn't tell you that, but my grandfather, my mother's father, she was he was at Nagasaki when the second bomb was dropped. Um, he survived the bomb drop, but he died years later of cancer, no doubt because he walked right through Nagasaki after the second bomb. But um, they had every reason to hate, totally hate my father as well. And yet they were able to overcome those uh, obstacles through common interests and likes. Of course, it started with my mother. Um, they met at a ship's party. Dad was uh, 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 at, they had a ship's party for the USS Estero. Dad was on a small cargo ship at the time as a radio man. And um, the short version of the story is first night, my mother was working at the restaurant for her brother who was running the restaurant. She was only 17. And uh, she was told uh, don't, the only word in English you need to know is no. <laughs> you don't need a bunch of sailors coming off the ship. They're going to have a party at this Japanese restaurant, 1952. And uh, Korean War is going. And um, 
half the crew gets off the ship and the next night, the other half of the crew is supposed to go. So that night, mom said she's serving all these drunk sailors and there's one sailor sitting at the bar who's, he's so nice and he's just drinking water. And he's very polite to her. All the other sailors are typical sailors, you know, trying to grab and do the things they did. And uh, she was very impressed with him. And she said, I fell in love with that man that night, but I knew he wasn't coming back because the other half of the crew would come the next night. Well, the next night he comes back and her immediate thought was, oh, my gosh, he's here for me. You know, the, uh, he wants he, he likes me. So she said he uh, danced with her and, and they had a wonderful time. But she said, but that night he was drinking and he drank a lot. And she said he got drunk, but she said it was too late. I was already in love with him. And from there, they started dating. Years later, she said she remembered that evening and all the drinking. She didn't like she did not like the drinking. But she said she asked him, why, why were you not drinking that first night? Because that's what caught her eye. And he thought about it for a minute, and then he, he started laughing. He said, oh, the first night. He said, I was on shore patrol the first night. And so she didn't know what that meant. So uh, had he not been assigned shore patrol that first night, uh, he would have been drinking, and they never would have met. So I always see those shore patrol armbands, and it always means something special to me. Had it not been for shore patrol duty, I'm, I wouldn't be here. So, uh, But they overcame a lot of differences. You're right. Mike, uh, Martin, that they, they, uh, their differences were overcome by things like my father and my uncle, both, and my grandfather, they all liked gardening. They liked woodworking. They loved fishing. And that's what they did together that was common. And from that sprang uh, trust and friendship. And from that sprang an understanding. Plus, my uncle, in all honesty, my dad had talked about that. There was that sense of, yeah, you were the enemy, but you also were, you know, there's some honor and respect because you were a warrior. You were, you did your job. Um, to my dad's knowledge and to my uncle's knowledge, neither one of them had participated in any atrocities, to, so to speak, directly. So um, they became best friends. <laughs> they became very good friends. And and my mother uh, says to this day of all she had uh, eight brothers and sisters of all the brother in laws she said my dad was her mother's favorite. Uh, he would come back even during the Vietnam War when we were stationed in California. He was on a fleet oiler and it would always stop in Sasebo, Japan, and and he would always come visit his in laws and he paid a lot of respect to them and he loved Japan. My dad <laughs> loved Japan. Um, he had no, uh, well, I'll tell you this. When he went back in in 1950, he did tell his recruiter down in Dothan, Alabama, uh, they needed radio men, so they, they wanted him back. And he said, I'll go anywhere except Japan. He told his recruiter that. And his recruiter said, sure, sure, come on in, sign the paper. So he did. And he said seven weeks later, he was standing in Japan. That's where the, the Navy sent him. Of course. <laughs> so he had a resistance to going to Japan. I think that's natural. But once he was there, he ended up staying till 1957. From 1950 to 57, seven years, he was stationed in Japan. That's unusually long. He wanted to be there. And um, he he fell in love with Japan. And to the day he died in 2001, um, tremendous respect for the Japanese in Japan. And my mother, the exact opposite. I mean, the tremendous respect for the United States and America. When dad died in 2001, my brothers and I kind of huddled up and said, you know, mom did her job. She put up with all this crap over the years, all this um, uh, discrimination and, and the issues early on, all the crying and, and tears. And we went to her and said, mom, it's OK now since dad's gone. You've done your job. You've raised us, all three of us, college degrees, all of that. You've done your job. You've done it well. It's OK if you want to go home. And I'll never forget the look on her face when she looked at us puzzled. And she said, but I am home. And yes, I thought, I love it. wow, I've never, it never occurred to me in all my years up to that point that she was way more American than she was Japanese. <laughs> and yeah. uh, that's when it hit home. And to this day, She's she lives in the house where her and dad bought in 1969 
and uh, she's going to die in that house. Uh, she's 87 years old. She'll be 87 in March. Harold said something interesting at the end of our show. He never told his parents what happened with the Indy. Just yeah. never, never mentioned it at all to him. And you would think, you know, you would tell your parents something. But did, how did your mom deal with what your dad's story was when well, she figured it out? And when did she figure it out? She, when, when dad was in 68, dad came home from work. He was uh, teaching crypto school at Portsmouth Naval or at Portsmouth, Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Portsmouth, Virginia, um, his last enlistment. Um, and I remember he was sitting at the dining room table in uniform and he was drinking. And him drinking wasn't unusual, but I could tell that he was upset about something. And he didn't, I mean, other than getting mad or, you know, that kind of thing, a chief petty officer mad uh, about things. Um, he was just sad unusually depressed and very, very quiet, unusual. And I remember I walked by and I knew dad's chief petty officer, the oldest son. I was, uh, what, 11, almost 12 years old. I remember thinking, well, I'm not going to ask him. That's That would be dumb. you know. <laughs> so I went to mom, you know, standing not too far away and said, mom, what's wrong with dad? And she said, today's the day his ship sank. And I said, what ship? I'd never heard the story. I didn't know. And uh, she's, and he'd already been, I knew his Vietnam stories. I just never heard his Korea or World War II stories. And she said, today is the day he was, his ship sank. And I said, what ship? I was all excited. And she looked at me and she said, I don't know. He's never told me. They'd been married 14 years at that point. So uh, I, uh, I uh, uh, waited a day or two and then I went to dad. And I asked him, I said, Dad, Dad, Mom saw, Mom told me you were on a ship that sank. I was, I was you know, I wanted to know the story. And I'll never forget. I said, I said, uh, what ship were you on? And he just stared at me and he said, the Indianapolis. And I said, what happened? And he just very calmly looked at me and said, it sank. And then he walked away. That was 1968, 69. And I... Um, I just uh, never asked him again. And it was uh, probably in the 70s when a reporter came to the house, found out about him being on the ship. He was working at General Electric then, and it was in their paper, the company paper. Somebody found out, and it made the news local. And that's the first time I ever heard that started paying attention to the story. I went and checked out the book Abandoned Ship by Richard Newcomb. It came out in 58. That's when I read and went, oh, my gosh, my dad's in there. It just, uh, I had no idea. And he didn't talk about it until probably after Jaws came out in 75. That's, a, that's when he started talking. And then he went to the reunion in 77, the submarine launching. But he didn't go back to another reunion until 95 when they dedicated the monument in the city of Indianapolis for the crew. And he went for that. Well, we all went, except for my mother. She didn't go. <laughs> She was afraid that this that uh, this was a ceremony for the families, and she was afraid she would upset it by being there. So she didn't go. And then in 2001, she was going to come to the, her first reunion with Dad, and he had been begging her for years to go. And she finally agreed. And Dad had been talking her up so much to the guys, and so he knew that she was welcome. She wasn't sure, but she was worried that they would feel uncomfortable, not that she would. And uh, she came. She agreed to come, but Dad died in May of 2001, and the reunion was July. So I just assumed she wouldn't go, and but she said no. I promised him I would go. So my brothers and I took her and my and my our wives, and uh, we went. And I'll never forget the first moment we showed up at the we showed up in Indianapolis after a nine hour drive from the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia to Indianapolis. We went straight to the monument because she wanted to see his name on the wall just before dark. And they were uh, there was a, a BBC film crew doing an interview with two of the survivors, uh, Mike Carilla and Bob McGigan. And uh, they were talking in front of the monument. So I stopped mom. She had, was holding a little rose, a little Japanese lady holding a holding rose. And I remember telling her, hey, w wait until they're done. So we waited. But Mike Carilla looked over and saw mom standing there and he must have realized who she was. So he stopped the interview. 
And uh, he motioned for her to come and they met about halfway towards the monument, the three of them, uh, Bob and Mike and my mother. And they hugged, and his tears be up. And they hugged and they cried. And all I saw was uh, healing. I saw a lot of healing going on right then. And that's when I started to realize that they all needed this. My mother needed it because dad was gone. And they needed it because they want they wanted to let go of all that pain that they had been carrying all their lives. And uh, that helped a little bit. And for the rest of that reunion, three days, there was a lot of hugging and a lot of crying and a lot of love. And I'll, I'll just never forget that. That's, that's when I started to realize that everybody needed this. All of us need this, that I carry pain because of my father and my mother. And I saw other survivor children and wives doing the same thing. We were all crying. We spent a lot of time crying. <laughs> it was uh, very emotional, very emotional. And I'm, I'm glad that mom went and I know it helped her. She kept saying over and over, this one's just like dad. This one's just like dad. She would talk about every one of the survivors. <laughs> this one's just like dad. Uh, they, you know, they have a lot in common. They, they come from every part of the country. They are of every different group that you could think of and every economic level. But they are. There are so many similarities. The pain is there. You can see the pain. It's it's. It's there. We've got seven survivors today. And, uh, you know, we cherish these seven guys that are left because they're the last of, of, of that generation of guys that are carrying this pain. And the good thing is the guys that are still here with us today, they, they, um, I think they, they are the most at peace of all the survivors. They've had the longest time to heal. And we've been in the healing mode probably for the last 25 years now. It's it's been a wonderful journey with these fellas. Uh, Harold Bray is so precious to me. He he is uh, yeah. he took over the organization in 2007 as the chairman, and under his leadership, that the real healing started. He started bringing all the lost at sea families back into our fold. Before that, it was mostly focused on survivors. We had so many of them, um, and now you know Harold wanted the uh, lost at sea families included. He wanted all of our rescue and recovery crews. They were hurting. They were out there too. They're still out yeah. there. Yeah. And you know we're trying to bring them all together. It's been a journey. Yeah. Been a that journey. reunion stuff is important. And I, I was sort of the uh, sort of the mayor of my senior class when we graduated, and I would get a lot of people saying, "I, I don't want to go." You know, there's nothing in there for me, and I'm like, "Yeah, but." When someone sees you and they've held something, you know, maybe they did you a wrong growing up or whatever, let them unburden it. Go, go because someone may have something that they want to get rid of and give them that chance. Because you're right, these, these reunions are times it's like that. I, I didn't even, I can't even remember this offense. Please put that rock down. Don't carry that around emotionally, you know, and here's everybody holding on to all this stuff. And, and you're right, these reunions give opportunities for, for that. That sort of healing, and then and then you're deeply involved with the organization now. Yeah, I, more so in the past couple of years. You know, one thing I've learned over many years, I worked for Atheon for years. Is you know, there's a time when you got to turn things over to some younger people and let them because we want this to perpetuate. We don't. I'm going to be 64 in March. Uh, we don't want uh, you know this to be just a children's thing. We want it to be a grandchildren and and so on and. We have so many what we call friends of the Indianapolis now. Uh, we have uh, the USS Indianapolis Legacy Organization that was created a couple of years ago that is uh, um, going to carry this forward. And, and you know, the, the survivors have appreciated the work we've done as volunteers. Um, we call ourselves uh, the, the uh, stewards of the Indianapolis because we, we basically serve the crew um, as children and friends and grandchildren. We're here to make sure that their legacy stays alive. And we tell the stories, but not just the history. You can go and read the history in the books. Uh, you know, there's a million books on the Indianapolis. What I try to do is come and encourage others to do is come and tell the stories of the guys. You know, we knew these guys. We've met these guys and most of them are gone, but their lessons are still with us. Um, you know, the, every one of the survivors, the never, never, never give up uh, mentality that the survivors have. 
And then I've learned so much from the Lost at Sea families over the last 20 years. Uh, something that I grew up in a survivor family. My perspective was over here. Theirs was over here. And now we've all come together and we're working together to try to make sure that that all of us uh, stay together as a family so that these remaining survivors know that their story's not going to die with them. That was their biggest worry. I remember the first time I met them, they started talking about that. You know, we're the only ones left to tell the story because there were none of us younger people out there telling it. Now we are. The good news is, is they still celebrate old Founders Day in Desmet. In, uh, South Dakota, <laughs> where the where the Ingalls Wilder family came from, they, 140 <laughs> years later, they're still celebrating. You know those those first folks. So you guys have uh, a lot of work to do to catch up to those guys. Hey, yeah. Martin, as you hear all this, all these stories, and you know when you compare that to the history that you know, what are your thoughts? I mean, this is this is blowing me away. Well, the opening of my book, Wounded Tiger, is uh, a scripture from the Bible saying. Uh, are we not all brothers? Are we not all children of the same God? And that really is the theme of the book. And I think that's a theme of what Jim's sharing, that uh, when we we see the other person as being different than us and something is wrong with them because they're so different. And Eastern and Western culture is very, very radically different. But when you get right down to it, we're really pretty much all the same. We have the same hopes and fears and desires and uh, it, it's, uh, it's really a good thing. So I think that this, uh, what you're sharing, Jim, about uh, these reunions and heart to heart, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, when you were talking, it reminded me of a woman I met, and I still know. She was in Fukuoka as a woman, as a little girl, and that's in between Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I asked her, what did she feel like when the war was over? And she said I was very relieved because we were living in bomb shelters. We just were going yeah. in bomb shelters all the time. She said, mm -hmm. but I was terrified of the Americans because I was told they're going to come and rape and murder and steal, and they're just monsters. She said, yes. the very first time I saw an American soldier, there was a group of them, and they were handing out chocolate and candy, and they're laughing and playing with the kids. She said, yes. as soon as I saw that, she said, I am going to marry an American. I'm going to America. And that's exactly what she did. And she was not bitter toward anyone, a very lovely woman, a lot of happiness. So unfortunately, Governments use propaganda to manipulate yeah. people to be afraid of the unknown yes. and to hate what we don't understand. But the right. fact is, um, it, when we humanize the other person, we can love them and they can love us. And really, when people talk about unity, there's a, a cost to it. And it means you have to be open, you have to be loving and understand that we're pretty much all the same. So to answer your yeah. question, you know, that's how I feel when I hear you share. Um, all wars begin by people hating each other because they're so terrible and other, but they can end with very happy endings. Like in your case, your yeah. father falling in love with a Japanese woman, which seems completely counterintuitive to what's going on. But uh, once you recognize the humanity of your enemy, it, it, it changes things. Yeah, and, my, and my mother uh, said this, the same thing. My father had a, a, a saying. He said, you, because he'd fought in three wars, he said, you, you have to demonize your enemies in order to to fight them. You, you just, you can't fight somebody you like. So you have to demonize and they do the same thing. Mom had a very similar story about her first contact with Americans. She told me that when she first saw an American, it was a fighter pilot that just buzzed and strafed a bunch of children. Um, and it was an American fighter plane. And that was her first, and it just confirmed what she had been told about Americans. She thought they were ugly, brutes, uh, uh, barbaric, dirty people. That's what they were told as children. And she said, suddenly this plane flies by, zooms past low-flying, strafing children on the road, a uh, dirt road. And she said, I caught a glimpse of him as he went by, and his cockpit was pulled back on the fighter plane. And she said he had a bald head, um, red skin, and big eyes. She said he looked like a bug. And, yeah, he's got his flight cap on, his goggles on and he's probably hot 110 degrees in that cockpit and that's what she saw in in her mind he was almost like an alien i mean he's not from this world ugly but she said then same experience the children are hiding in the house the americans are marching down the street uh american gis in occupation the parents are hiding the children they they're afraid that the americans are still going to slaughter them um 
and the and they the Americans would throw things into the yard, uh, toilet paper, soap, candy, all kinds of anything out of their backpack they could carry because they knew that these Japanese people and the children had nothing. And she said they would throw the candy away because they were convinced the candy was poison. And she said that they did that several times. And, and finally, one of the GIs, knowing what was going on, hopped the fence in their little front yard reached down and just randomly picked up a piece of candy and popped it in his mouth. And she said, and these were her words, that's the moment I knew they lied to us. Mm. Americans are not, you know, the, these uh, animals, they're, they're kind. They're trying to help us. And uh, from that moment on, she said, when the Americans would come down the street, the kids would all go and grab them by the leg and, <laughs> you know, and the guys would play with them. And, she said, I fell in love with America. And those GIs did that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a politician. It wasn't, you know, a government thing or a mandate or time. It was that instantaneous, sincere caring by a soldier who they didn't expect it from. Change, changed my mother. She said at that moment, she was the same way. I fell in love with America and Americans. And eventually, wanted to come to the United States. So, Martin, do you have any... Uh, Since 57, so I guess it's stuck. <laughs> it's stuck. Martin, do you have any final questions at all for, for Jim? <laughs> oh, well, this is, it's, a, it's a big question, but the use of the atomic bomb remains controversial to this day. Uchida uh, yeah. was in Hiroshima the day before they dropped the bomb, and he, was, he came there the day after. All his buddies were killed, you know, 100,000 yeah. plus people died, etc., but when he was asked by another officer, how could the Americans do this? Puchita's response was, this is war. If yes. we had the bomb, I would have been happy to drop it on the Americans. That's just war. He didn't have any problem with it. So what are your thoughts on that without, with understanding you've got like one minute? What are your feelings being a half Japanese, half American, having a dad who was on the Indianapolis that transported the nuclear material? What are your thoughts about the use of the nuclear weapon in Japan? Uh, I can take sum as it up much time as you need. Don't rush. Okay. Well, I can I can I can sum it up with uh, a, a, an incident that happened. I was doing a presentation at Blue Ridge Community College in Virginia, and my mother just happened to be at this particular presentation. We had five survivors and two or three rescue men on the stage, and the and the audience was mostly locals and college students. And I had a young 18-year-old boy stand up in the back of the room when we took questions and answers at the end. And he looked at my survivors and he said, do you, uh, having delivered the atomic bomb to Japan, do you feel guilty for having killed so many innocent civilians? Those were his words. This is what we learn in school as, as young Americans. And I remember... <laughs> The guys are, I know their answer on the stage. You know, they felt like what they did was they had to do it. Otherwise, millions of Americans and really millions of Japanese were going to die. But I said, I had this rare opportunity. I went to my mom because she had, we had just talked about it maybe a month before that. I never thought to ask her that question, Martin. You know, I mean, I, I just knew the answer because I grew up in the family. But I, so I said, Mom, would you answer his question? So I had her stand up and I gave her the mic. And all she said was, dropping those bombs saved my life. And keep in mind, my grandfather was at Nagasaki. One of the bombs was dropped on him. And what she meant, what she meant by, and explained later was, had we not dropped those bombs, her government would not have surrendered, and they would have died in the invasion. They would have died in the invasion. And we're talking upwards of, I'm, I'm my talking to my family, 10 to 20 million Japanese. We talk about the half million to a million and a half Americans or allies. We got to remember there were a lot of Japanese that truly believed like my mother and your friend, Martin, that they were going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's why they, that's why they had that mentality of fighting to the death that we attribute to their, their ethnicity. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do more with propaganda than anything else. If we believed that we were going to die, we would have done the same thing. And that's what I try to drive home to these young people, that, they're, that we should not, as Americans, feel guilty for having ended that war. We should be happy because my father said, you know, war is hell. You fight a war to win, people die. But the whole idea is to end the war. 
so people will stop dying, not drag it on for 20, 30 years like we're doing now. It makes no sense. If you want to support the the folks who remember the indie, whether it's survivors or rescuers or kids or grandkids or people who got off the ship, the you know, in Vallejo, all of these folks, you can go to www.ussindianapolis.com. They meet every year, if possible, F you COVID, uh, you know, in Indianapolis so that they can continue the healing process, continue remembering. And I mean, this story is remarkable. And it's a yeah. shame that so many of us only know of this through Jaws, you know, that there is so much history to understand your uncle's history of, of fighting. I mean, we had Victor Davis Hanson on the show a while back talking about his history of World War II. And he's like, and in this country, and in this country, and in this country, you know, we think <laughs> World War II is D-Day, yeah. Berlin surrenders, you know, uh, Pearl yeah. Harbor, some island hopping, and then a bomb, everybody surrenders. Right. But it's it's a true world war. And it's great that you guys are out there not only telling this story, but helping us get it right. You know, it's an incredible thing you guys are doing. And I, I appreciate it that you're coming on the show and I appreciate you telling the story and I appreciate you, Martin, for telling your incredible story because these are horrible, horrible things. And these folks aren't supposed to like each other. And here they are. We have two love stories between two nations in two different books. And and it's just incredible. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank you so much too, for having us on here. I I appreciate being able to share the story and uh, I hope one day, you know, this story will become more normal for telling stories. I know we have some Vietnam stories that are very similar as well. Uh, yeah. There's been a lot of healing over many generations, but I think, Martin, I was I did uh, get a chance to read some of the book already, and um, fantastic story. I can't wait to finish it and, and have a conversation with you. Martin, Thanks anything in closing? No, I think that's a bit. We're all the same. We all have the same <laughs> desires, and friendship is absolutely possible, but we have to love, and that that's sometimes expensive. Mm-hmm.